Hey everyone, welcome to another episode on the Asian Hustle Network podcast. You know, today we have a very special guest. I'll let him introduce himself real quick. But yeah. usually, with our first guest, we want to talk about their story, their upbringing, how they became the person you are today. But we want to hear more about you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Brian, for for the opportunity to meet with you.、Uh, I'm a big fan of your work, firstly. So, just want to say thank you for for reaching out.、Um, so, a little background on myself: I'm Maurice Ain. I'm a general partner at Tings Capital. So we are early stage VC fund focusing on Series A and C stage opportunities.、Uh, we have a focus on investing into、uh, what we call the underdog founders, and there are people of color, women entrepreneurs, people in the LGB communities, first gen immigrants like myself, and people with disability as well.、Uh, we focus predominantly in the U.S. and Canadian ecosystem,、uh, with check size anywhere from one million to five million.、Um, so yeah, happy to dive into more if you guys would love. You know, be interested to learn more. Of course, I mean, I think it's really cool that you put such an emphasis on, you know, that typically founders who are overlooked in this industry, right? Because、yeah. personally, for me, I see. I mean, I hate the statistic of like women being like the lowest percent, like women of color being the low, lowest percentage of like getting venture capital money, right?、Mm-hmm. And I'm starting to see a lot of newer funds and thanks,、mm-hmm. and also yours too, that are addressing this issue. But I want to know, like, what was?、Mm-hmm. How did you become the person you are today? Yeah.、Right? What? How did? How does inspiration and drive to like bring forth like representation and supporting these communities come from? What is your? What is your upbringing like? Yeah.、Uh, let's dial back the clock. Literally eleven, twelve years ago,、uh, when I first came to this country、uh, at the age of seventeen.、Um, And I moved here quite abruptly. My dad used to own a business、uh, back in Hong Kong.、Uh, he used to own a jewelry business.、Um, he had like a little shop in the Sheraton Hotel selling souvenir.、Uh, you know, not the best kind of like jewelry, but like just like you know more、uh, of like novelty goods at a Sheraton Hotel. And during the financial crisis, obviously the business you know selling novelty doesn't do so well,、uh, which is. You know, in a comparable type of、uh, ecosystem that we're in right now,、um, and I recall、um, approximately about a month before I moved to to the U.S.,、uh, which at the time I didn't even know, my dad was like, "Hey, Maurice,、uh, could you come by the store on Saturday to help me unload some, you know, merchandise off the shelf?" And and he had like a trolley, and he decided to basically wheel all the merchandise to the flea market and sell all his inventory for like seventy five percent off. Um, I was shocked. Like, Dad, why are you selling all your stuff for seventy five percent off for no reason? It was like, oh yeah, you know, you know, this this merchant cut me a good deal, so he、uh, they want to be supportive. But at the time, I realized over time that my dad was in a serious financial situation, and he was basically trying to accumulate some dollars、uh, so we could afford a plane ticket, so we could fly across to be with my uncle in New York. So my life started like basically from ground zero、uh, at the age of seventeen, turning into eighteen,、um, and I had a realization that, wow, like I am moving to a new country. I don't know anything. My parents literally have like three thousand dollars wrapped up in like a rubber band with like the envelope that was given by my uncle as just like to get us by a little bit as we are setting out, you know, settling down in New York.、Um, And at that point, I realized that, wow, I need to really step up to support my family. So my first job was、uh, at McDonald's,、uh, try to get my, you know, just get some income here and there. And me, I was speaking very little English at the time. Try to basically acclimate myself with the culture, acclimate myself with just the academics in the U.S. And I stumbled upon it in a public school. I went to Baruch College,、uh, but. Weirdly, at the time, I didn't know Baruch College was known for accounting and finance.、Uh, I studied pre-med instead because I didn't know anything, right? And、uh, I just basically studied for three years、uh, in school, pretty much completed my pre-med prerequisites, and then decided to shift gears、um, onto、uh, becoming a finance major. So it took me about like four and a half years to graduate.、Um, And、uh, the whole time, I was just like struggling, trying to find a way to provide stability to my family, tr- try to provide just income source, so so my parents don't don't have to like suffer and and, and try to just like get back up on our feet, 
right? And especially, I put a lot of weights on my shoulder uh, as the as the you know the oldest son in the family. And I think Brian, you could resonate as an Asian, you know, son in your family that you kind of put, put that on your shoulder. And especially as an immigrant, just try to acclimate and make my parents as comfortable as possible. I knew that to be financially successful is something I need to do. It's not something that I have a choice to, right? So I put my pre-med dream to the side. I knew that I could not afford to go to medical school, nor invest eight years of my life to become a resident to hope that, you know, I can be a doctor someday, which I don't think I'm smart enough to do so. So I hustle my way, literally, um, do whatever it takes coming from a public school, uh, I was getting good grades, and I was very fortunate to recruit into investment banking uh, at J.P. Morgan, work in uh, mergers and acquisition, and that subsequently worked in private equity. And I realized that investing, cultivating businesses, working with management team, working with founders, investing is something that I love doing. It's something that I'm highly passionate about, and I realized I'm very good at. Um, and then... As it, as it progressed, I decided to also get some operational experience by working at a company called SurveyMonkey, uh, supporting the executive, um, uh, learning how, you know, the ropes of how to operationalize a business. And that was also during the pandemic. And then, like, when you're working at home for hours, you know, sometimes like 12, 14 hours per day, um, you come to a realization, like, what do you love doing? What is the, the thing that you that you're passionate about? What is the mission that you want to be cultivating going forward? And I realized that with the George Floyd movement, with the Asian hate crime, you know, activities that we're seeing in the ecosystem, right? It is our time, you know, as Asian American to be stepping up for ourselves and to supporting the ecosystem. So that's why I decided to start Things Capital um, with my personal capital, but luckily to have some uh, LP commitments uh, so far on to supporting the mission. That is a, that is an amazing story, right? And it, it definitely embodies the immigrant story of hustling, making things happen. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so many parallels with my own personal life too. I usually think that I got dealt really short, a really short hand, right? Mm-hmm. Really bad cards. Until I listened to your story, I realized that your cards are probably worse than mine. <laughs> you know? no. And and you made it work, right? The pressure of being the older son, the oldest son in the family, mm-hmm. is tough, right? I am also the oldest son in my family, but it didn't always start that way. I was actually one of the youngest sons. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my older two brother passed away, then became the oldest son. Mm-hmm. So to assume that position, I completely understand you that mindset, right? Absolutely. And to be at the age where you can comprehend what's going on in your family, especially at age 17 and knowing that you need failure is not an option, right? You need to go out there and make money. You need to go out there and support, Mm -hmm. right? That is, I feel like that is an extra chip in your shoulder that no one can ever take away from you. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Brian. Um, And it's, it's a complete life. 180 degrees change. Cause back before when I was in Hong Kong, I was always, like a C plus student. I was cutting class. I could care less about school. Uh, But when life really hits you and you have to be really start from ground up, right? And you see your parents, you see them suffering. You see my dad, you know, he, he used to be a business owner. Now he has to work as like a sales clerk, start completely ground zero. And we are really running thin, right? Sharing one bedroom, in a bunk bed where my mom and my sister sleep on the top bunk bed. My dad and I sleep on the bottom bunk bed. Um, At the same time, like try to learn English, right? At the time I didn't really speak English the way that I speak now. Hopefully I'm still, I'm coherent enough that you guys can understand me that I just had that military style of, you know, just making sure that I am, I could get as competitive as possible, not just academically, which luckily I'm very good at, you know, in school, but also socially and and culturally at the same time, which I want to emphasize that point that, you know, it was not just like, oh, I go to school and I can be successful, get good grades. It's also about, you know, literally infusing my, myself, my life into a completely new ecosystem. Give yourself a lot of credit, right? You're balancing almost three 
things at the same time that are pretty massive. Accumulation, assimilation of culture, understanding culture, language barrier, academics. I think most people would vote under that type of pressure. But for you to continue to thrive and do academically well. And to be mm-hmm. honest, when I talk to you, I understand just fine. Like there's nothing, there's no language barrier between us at all. Right. Yeah. And that speaks volume to yourself and your character. Right. Yeah. And I really like the part where you mentioned that you want to support the underrepresented. And I personally feel the same way. You know, I think this is where we have absolutely alignment in that, in that sense, because mm-hmm. for me, I grew up in section eight, section eight housing. So the, so the story about you sleeping in bunk beds with your parents, I had a very similar upbringing. <laughs> you know, it's almost identical. Um, yeah. And for us, at least for me, at least, I'm kind of curious too that, you know, when I was growing up and going through like section eight and lower income and had my parents being on welfare, mm-hmm. I realized that my peers and my, and my new peers now, I mean, I'm really fortunate to be able to connect with like the, the brightest and greatest out there to realize that there's really no difference between the two, right? Except that there's a philosophical difference, not philosophy differences. You can do it and you should work hard and keep your head down. That's the only philosophical difference, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. I really want to take this, this opportunity to talk about Ting's Capital and how you're addressing that issue and finding the underdog founders. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, like I realized over time as I work in investing for close to about half a decade, I realize I understand what it's like to, you know, turn an idea into a business model that's viable and then subsequently build a legacy going forward. And the rationale behind backing underdogs is that I am an underdog, right? I was a not the best student, right? And when I had to basically turn my life 180 degrees at the age of 17, 18 years old, I've lived through one decade of how to cultivate, I guess, academic, cultural, and at the same time, social success onto building a platform, right? So um, reflecting on my ex- investment experience, reflecting on my cultural alliance and, 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 and alignment with these founders to, that are come from the underdog backgrounds that were identified as people of color, like which you and I, Bo Brian, and you and I are, women where, you know, has historically been, you know, suppressed, you know, people in the LGB community, which statistically speaking, um, you know, most of the founders, most of the investors are, you know, afraid to speak up and and be proud of their, you know, their sexual orientation that, and and immigrants, like, like, like you and I have lived through it, that we just intuitively have that extra chip on our shoulder to prove to the world that we have what it takes, right? But all we, like what, what I provide to them in addition to financial capital is also that, that, that partnership, right? That marriage that I can cultivate alongside with them to turn that idea that they have, you know, which are sometimes just the seed stage investments into something that is viable into a business model that something they could raise to series A, B, C, D, and then all the way to IPO, right? So, what Tings Capital provide is a long-term marriage with our founders and our LPs and our GPs, right? Onto cultivating an ecosystem where the underdogs are, they will feel safe and we are all aligned on building value, cultivating the next generation and a legacy going forward. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really awesome to hear. Right. And then, you know, I think that financial capital investment is important, but being able to help them along the process is also equally important, right? Yeah. And I think the misconception is that people think that you're successful if you raise a lot of money, but that's not true at all. Like you, the, the pressure starts there. Like the work starts there. Like the, the sleepless night starts there, right? Exactly. How you build a viable business after you raise the capital is a completely different board game. Right? Exactly. And I'm really happy to, to hear that you're providing that, that support because being a founder and going through that journey, it's honestly very lonely and honestly, it is. sometimes uh, very dark. You know, you're doubting yourself all the time. You make pivots, you make, you make decisions and you feel all the ramifications from that, right? Exactly. And I want to talk about today's market, right? And mm-hmm. as we are recording the podcast right now, we're currently mid-June. So the podcast probably be released about mid-July. Right. So about a month later. Right. And currently the markets is tough and it's tough 
especially being in the VC world, you see that raising capital right now is tough. There's mm-hmm. founder, well, even YC issue a letter recently saying that this is going to be a very cold winter. Be prepared to like, you know, cut down your, your, uh, mm-hmm. your spendings and hold on to your, everything yep. you can. Right. So knowing this, what kind of advice would you have for other VCs and founders trying to raise capital in this type of market? Yeah. I think ultimately raising capital uh, for founders um, is important, but I think it's a secondary factor onto cultivating long-term success, right? I think it's important that founders identify their true value proposition and how they can make their value proposition, you know, sustainable, right? During the downturn. Um, I don't think capital raising is the solution, right? It can help them, but it's important that they build a business that's resilient, um, that they, you know, during the downturn, despite it's tough on their soul and their emotions, that the founder as the leader of the organization, that their employees are supporting them. Making sure that your employees, you know, as, as a founder sees you as the, as the vision, as the leader, as their guiding north, north light, that we'll get through this together right? We'll be able to ride this out, right? And I think that's like the mindset that founders should have that I think as especially in the early stage, I think resiliency is extremely important. And then it's grit and hard work, right? And me as a, as a VC, my job is to, you know, motivate them, provide them with financial guidance and support, but also to be on the, you know, serving, you know, as like a, like a partner, like, in the, in the marriage, right? Which is, and I want to make sure that in addition to financial capital that I'm supporting you on, that you are also emotionally and motivationally aligned on the long-term vision, right? Because the recession is gonna, is happening, but it's not going to happen for the next 10 years, hopefully, right? So as long as you can stay on the course of nature, stay aligned to your long-term vision and your goal, continue to refine on your value proposition and your business model, making sure that you boost company morale, getting through this um, and, 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 you know, get, get this past in your life uh, will be, you know, will be a true testament to your belief and your, and your vision. Right. So I think that's on the founder side and on the, on the venture capital side. Right. I think, um, I think because of valuation is, you know, becoming more and more, I guess, uh, palatable for investors at, at lower valuations, uh, it allows us to be a little bit more, um, you know, deploy capital into companies that, you know, firstly, you know, aligns with our thesis, aligns with our value proposition, but also at the same time, we are able to purchase them at a lower valuation. So by the time the market on a macro perspective rebound, um, it will, it will allow us to generate a good return from there, right? But right now we have to be extremely disciplined onto deploying capital into businesses that align with our, in, in, our, in our thesis, which we define at Tanks Capital as the 3D business model, a business that is disruptive, differentiated, and defensible, right? And, and then also at the same time, the, the, the coachability uh, of the founder onto working on this marriage with us for decades to come. Yeah, I mean that's that's really good to hear about the the relationship and your views on this, you know, downturn and cold winter. Kind of curious too about your structure, right? And talking about their structure of Tings Capital, it sounds like you guys work really closely with founders, which is an amazing thing, right? I think mm-hmm. that having that relationship with your investor and investee is important. Kind of curious, like let's talk about the structure of the fund real quick. Let's say you have, for example, like $10 million fund or $20 million fund, right? Mm -hmm. How many companies do you typically invest to per fund? Mm -hmm. And also how do you divide up your day so then you can have enough time to constantly check in with your founders, check in with Mm -hmm. your portfolio. Even if you're done with this fund, talk to the founders from the previous fund. Like what does that, what does that structure look like for you for Teams Capital? Yeah, so, um, and I think the, the, the portfolio construction really depends on the fund size and which will correlate with the ratio of the check size as well, right? Um, and with respect to the way that 
that we spend our energy and our time with our founders uh, would be um, we have bi-weekly calls with our founders and we kind of sprinkle that across, you know, ideally at Tanks Capital, we will have 20 to 25 portfolio companies, right? But it would not make that much sense if we have like 20 calls per week with all the founders, right? So it's important that we keep, you know, a, a dialogue going and communicatively, you know, transparent by having various different portals of communications, right? So founders will write us up, you know, maybe uh, a bi-weekly update via email. But we always like have our phone open, have our Slack channel open. If they need some one-on-one -on -one time on an emergency perspective, we're there to support them, right? If you need me to fly out there to be in supportive of what you're doing, contingent on my schedule, I will try to make it work, right? Think of this as like, we're all very busy, but when, when life happens and you need our support, right, we, we're there for you. But in a structural perspective, it will be weekly calls with some of our founders, right, that we, you know, have just built an early relationship on. And then we'll scale that down to more of a bi-weekly call to more like a monthly call us, you know, we feel more comfortable, right? Because we ultimately understand that is a kind of a ramp up process, you know, for, for our founders. And we want to cultivate that trust slowly, uh, onto understanding how you know we work together communicatively but also tactically but as we feel comfortable um you know we will scale that down a little bit more and the cycle repeats from there but we're always open we are always responsive because we understand that uh founders need, need our help right so think of you know as a vc you basically you know if i was invested into 25 portfolio companies all these 25 founders would be like my husbands or wives and I want to be a good partner to them. So I want to, you know, show that I'm there for them, you know, but they also understand that my, my bandwidth can be stretched and limited sometimes. So it's just about, you know, being thoughtful, being empathetic towards one another. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's really good. Good analogy too. I don't know about the analogy of having that many husband and wives. It sounds, it sounds like a terrible idea. Yeah. No, you can that, that yeah, minus the kidding. obviously the complexity of politics and uh, obviously the normal like type of husbands and wives relationship, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, I know what you mean. I'm just teasing you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I'm kind of curious too. Like ever since starting King's Capital and being involved with that many founders, right, working with 25 at a time, how has your perspective on the world changed, right, from like mm -hmm. the very beginning to now, like? How do you view the world? I know it's a very tough question to ask, but like, mm -hmm. it's very enlightening for us to hear your own mental journey. Yeah. Um, I think as a VC, in, you know, like I mentioned earlier in, in my point, is that in addition to just financial capital or strategic advice to the founders, um, being empathetic towards the founders is extremely important understanding um, how I can be supportive of, of the founders or one another, what motivates that person, what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses and how I can complement them. It's, it's a skill that, I'll, you know, that I've refined over time uh, because I, I'm speaking with, you know, on a weekly basis, maybe 30 to 50 people sometimes, right? And it's important for me to exercise my, my, my mental muscle you know, with a high level of flexibility and at the same time, you know, be engaged and at the same time show that I, I care and that I'm empathetic towards your pain points and your weakness, but also celebrate the, the small wins that we that we also doing together, right? Um, so I think that's something that I've learned over time is to firstly, you know, be, be more empathetic, but also be more flexible in terms of, you know, be a good listener, but at the same time, like identify the pain points on how I can complement them um, is something that I learned to pick up on when I'm, when I'm, you know, engaging or listening uh, and communicating with founders. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Right. I think that just evolving your sense of empathy with founders is extremely important already. Yep. Um, I mean, I think someone mentioned it before, like there's different meetup groups out there, different masterminds called founders therapy. And it's basically a group of founders that come together and they just vent, they cry, they complain <laughs> because it's, it's, a, it's a rough process, right? And I think that have, having that, knowing that 
you know, what founders go through and, and their struggles is important to helping them, right? Exactly. And I think that prior to how, this is my own perception, right? Prior to how things were before, I think that nowadays we're, more, we're humanizing the process more, mm-hmm. right? I feel like before it was like, I want my 10X, I want my 100X, I want my 1000X, whatever it is, right? And you treat people like a number, right? But then you realize with the newer way of doing business and the proper way of doing business is to offer support, right? Offer the empathy, offer the connections, offer the insight, uh, offer a new perspective. That's a great point, yeah. But at the same time, find find balance, right? You don't want to like tell them what to do, (laughs) you know? You want them to think about what they want to do because at the end of the day, you support their vision. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think a a misconception or... um, uh, some most people believe, right? And I, I want to correct that 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 thinking is that um, the founders kind of work for the investors or the VCs, but I actually think the opposite. Like I think of myself um, as Tanks Capital, we are in the hospitality business. We run like a really like hopefully a, a, a five star hotel where the founders feel comfortable onto working with us, stay in our residence, you know, at Tanks Capital Hotel, if you may. And it's my job that I serve them as a partner, that I support them when they need help. It's, it's basically I am their employee, right? Not the other way around, right? It's not just like, oh, you come to me for a check and that's it. Because I will only be successful or Tanks Capital, the organization will only be successful and the LPs will only cultivate financial return if our founders are successful right so we are in a full alignment of interest and it's my job to make sure that we are holding each other accountable but in a way you know that to make the founders feel like that hey i'm here for you i'm here to support you we in this marriage together and we're going to ride this out together and we're going to make returns going forward so that's the um, the the relationship dynamic that i uh that i want to you know make sure that is addressed yeah of course of course and yeah. kind of curious too like what is what is next for team's capital where do you envision yourself in the next 5 10 15 20 years yeah and what do you want to accomplish um through the life cycle of team's capital yeah that's a great question um i think in the next 10 years uh we aspire to be uh hopefully a billion dollar fund um we were deploying that into across 250 portfolio companies supporting um, 2,500 plus underdog executives, which all of these companies will touch the lives of millions around the world, right? Our goal and aspiration is to cultivate as many underdog millionaires and billionaires in the world, right? And my life aspiration is... um, like many would hope like, oh, you will drive a nice car, have a fancy house or whatever. My aspiration is to do something completely different. Um, I hope that someday I become so successful that I can, you know, establish a school and institution. And I'll name that after my parents or, you know, some, you know, or my dad specifically um, to show that, you know, we've been through this, this, this journey, this life cycle um, now I want to give back to the community. And by the end, you know, hopefully I can live until I'm 100 years old, 85 years old. I'll donate all my holdings and all my assets back into the community um, for the good cost, you know, um, that eventually one day that the so-called underdog that we define, so like that we have, or the underrepresented, or even the concept of diversity and inclusion will no longer be in existence. It will be obsolete going forward. So that's the goal. That's the legacy that I want to build upon uh, with Tanks Capital. That's amazing. You know, um, there's no doubt in my mind that you'll get there, right, with your determination. And I'm excited to witness this this journey unfold and definitely have you on the podcast in a couple of years down the line to uh, give our listeners an update, you know. 
So we do have uh, two more questions. The next question is: sure. If you were, if you to restart at any, if you to restart at any point in your career, what would you have done differently? Um, that's a great question. Firstly, um, it's a maybe I could answer the question in a different way. Um, I think I'm in a very, very privileged and lucky situation to be to be doing what I'm doing right now, like pursuing my goal and my on all my life aspiration, right? But if you ask me five years ago or ten years ago, hey Brian, hey Maurice, did you think that you were going to be doing this at this time in your life? The answer would be no, because ten years ago I was a terrible student. I all I care about was like. I don't know, playing video games, um, collecting Pokemon cards, uh, um, just hanging out with friends, playing basketball, right? That was never like my, in, in my mind at all, right? Um, but because of luck and because of just, I guess, having a chip on my shoulder to support my parents and get us out of their financial slump, it made me grow up exponentially faster than a typical 30-year-old. Because I am still in my early 30s, right? But I've grown up so much that some people have spoken with me before. They're like, like I, I spoke to you on the phone, Maurice, but I thought you were like in your 40s or something like that. That's always something that I, I, I have, you know, people told me about. Like, you always sound a lot older than you are, actually. But that's because I had to, you know, for me to stay competitive and, you know, be on the on the same playing field as all the other ones, you know, other people on my, that are my peers, I have to be at the level that I have to be. Right. So I don't know if I can make any corrections with what I've done so far, because, you know, if I was, if I was never put into this situation, move across to a different country with nothing to begin with, I don't think I would have the same level of drive ambition and aspiration it's all an evolution that metamorphosized into what i'm doing and then now this is a i guess the fruition of the i guess um pressure that cultivate into a diamond type of way uh hopefully you understand my analogy of course of course i I love i love that answer a lot man and really, really happy and fortunate to have you in the podcast today and share that story so Maurice, how can our listeners find out more about you and more about Tings Capital? Yeah, uh, check out our website on tingscapital.com. Um, and we do, uh, we we are starting to do a little bit more uh, like social media. We have like, like our small uh, Instagram accounts. Uh, we start posting a little bit more on LinkedIn. Uh, so yeah, watch out for more content that's coming. Um and something that I, I look forward to doing with you, Brian, because you are a superstar and I you're a rock star in your in in what you're doing. Um, I look forward, you know, for us, Tings Capital, to be collaborating with you because I, I I believe you know I, I like you and and I think you're a good friend of mine. That I and and I understand that in, in venture, especially, um, it takes a village to be cultivating the legacy that we are trying to build upon. Right, I cannot do this by myself. And I will never say that, oh, I did this all by myself at Tanks Capital, right? And I'm really lucky and fortunate to have you, Brian, uh, and your team to be in supportive of what we're doing at Tanks Capital. So I look forward to, you know, cultivating uh, this marriage with you, Brian. Uh, hopefully you don't mind being married with me. I, 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 I accept. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, definitely, man. I think that you're doing great things, I think. Mm. I think during the podcast, I was listening to it. I'm just like, there's this parts where I'm like, you are like the East Coast version of me. <laughs> you know, I had the exact same, uh, same aspirations as you. And I can't wait to collaborate more down the line. And That's for cool. our listeners, we'll include all that in the show notes. And Maurice, uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Pleasure. Appreciate it.